Okay, so I guess we'll do a quick, just an overview of what we covered last week for the, the two guys that weren't here uh, for last week, and of course, because this will be getting posted online, so it's nice to have a refresher, a carry through from the, the, the last lesson. Uh, my question for the night that I wanted everybody to think about while we're here was, uh, when in court, how can you prove you do not perform a function of government? And that's for summary convictions. So we'll see if anybody can come up with any decent answers to that. Maybe we'll write them down along with anybody's questions that they're going to have for later. Uh, if we want to talk about something after we go through all this real quick. So uh, we'll pick up from where I left off last time, which was uh, changing what I'm technically calling the legal person. Well, the, the, uh, I, I referred to it last time as a presumption of law, which it is. But people understand the word legal person better. So we'll start with the legal person. And the mistake people are making when they go to court is they think that the legal person is a new name just for them. Or something they represent exclusively or something that binds statutes to them or something bad that they don't want any part of or any other explanation that we've heard people come up with for a legal person. When really, all, in fact, what a legal person is, obviously it is, is its own identity. It's its own legal person. It has rights. It can own property. It can sell property. It can do anything it wants to. No one owns title to the legal person. Nobody. Because it is its own entity. You can't own legal title to something that's technically living. And the reason for that is there's about three main components that make up a legal person that are indistinguishable from one another when looking at just the legal person. Even the Supreme Court of Canada has a ruling. I've got it somewhere that basically the court doesn't see any difference between you, the man, and the legal person. You're one and the same. But that doesn't mean that you are the legal person. The reason they say that is because you make up a vital component of the legal person. And that's the important concept to understand there. Because the same way that corporations are created, uh, we're going back to trust law, which is what we talked about last time, but I'll explain it better this time in ways that everybody understands. And hopefully everyone's had time to reflect on that and get it more through their head, right? So where does the legal person come from? And you guys know from last time that when you're born, particulars of a live birth is filled out and your parents and the government come together and sign an agreement that basically forms a new legal entity. And so what they've done is your parents came forward as because uh, you're still a child and they are your guardians because you can't make decisions. They've gifted your portion of the Commonwealth into the whole trust of the Corporation of Canada. Right? So they are the grantors the grantor of essentially what is yours, your equity, your, your ownership of a portion of the Commonwealth, they gifted that to Canada, so which is just the big trust, if you want to call it that. It's a big corporation. It's a big trust. So with your parents as the grantor, um, grantor slash or slash beneficiary. That's why your parents get the uh, benefic. I'll learn how to spell beneficiary. Okay. So now we know the legal person is a trust, and we'll get into why it is a trust as soon as we get the roles all figured out first. Okay. So we know from trust law that there is always going to be a grantor slash beneficiary, and I've had people argue with me that the grantor and the beneficiary are two different parts of a trust. Okay, that, that's nonsense. The grantor and the beneficiary are the same person. Whoever puts the value in, that's who it's owed to. You can't get more simple of a concept than that. Okay, so the other two roles of a trust are the uh, trustee down here. And what's the last role of a trust? Okay, or in trust law, executor. Right. So this relationship created this guy right here, who's his own legal person. The grantor and the beneficiary, when you were age 1 to 14, was your parents. When you became 14, I believe, doesn't really matter, it could be 16, could be 18, which is the age majority, but for the most part, 14, 
I believe, is your act, the actual age you can start to contract at. I don't believe the 18 thing. There's a lot of biblical references to 14 and some other lawful references to 14, but for lack of even needing clarity, you, the man, at some point become <coughs> the grantor be slash beneficiary because everything that you own, everything that went into the legal person was yours by birthright. So that's what makes you the grantor and the beneficiary of everything in the legal person. All right, so now we're going to make the switch to corporate law, which actually mirrors, it directly mirrors trust law. And that's actually what a corporation is. It's a trust, right? They just call something else to, to confuse people and get everybody walking into court and making ridiculous arguments. And it seems to have worked pretty well for about 2,000 years. So if this guy right down here is the grantor and the beneficiary of a trust, if you were to switch this to the Dean Clifford Corporation, you got to remember that's all lawyers do is they switch names around to confuse people when the names mean the same thing. We all know from Canadian law even that a corporation and a legal person are synonymous terms. They're the same thing. And it's the only thing a government can deal with. They can't deal with a man, so they had to make you an agent in commerce is probably the best word I've heard for it yet. So now Dean C. Clifford, the man, is the grantor and the beneficiary, but now we're talking corporate law. What would that equal in corporate law? What position would you be if you were the grantor, the guy that put all the money into something? Shareholder. 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 So, we know that I'm the shareholder now because I put all the money into something. I'm the one who gets all the dividends. I'm the, I'm the one that gets all the benefits. The corporation basically can't exist without me. That's why I'm an integral part of it. Who would, uh, what would an executor be in, uh, in corporate law? Anybody? Director. Be director. Every, every corporation has directors, a board of directors, the people that set policy for the corporation. So you've got a director up here. And we'll just really quickly identify the other part. Who would trustees be in corporation corporate law? Who obeys the policies of the policymakers? Employees. Employees. Isn't it nice how it even ends in two E's, both words? Trustee and employee. Okay. So we're just going to play some fill in the blanks here. So it makes the most amount of sense. So now if we switch trust law to corporate law, we come up with the, the, the most simple equation there is in law. Shareholder, director, employee relationship. That is a trust, period. So we know who these guys are already, but we'll get into that. How do we know who the director is? The shareholders of a appointed Shareholders appoint directors. Correct. If a shareholder doesn't like what a director is doing, they have shareholders meetings. And shareholders vote, and shareholders appoint or remove directors from the board. So, well, we'll leave that position up there right now. So, you know right now that the shareholder of a corporation appoints the director, because they want to make sure the directors are setting the proper policy for these guys to follow so that they get the maximum return on their investment. And that's how the flow works. So, the directors set policy for a corporation, they tell the employees what to do, the employees carry out those instructions, and the shareholder receives the dividend. And that's the holy trinity. That's trust law, corporate law, that's the way the entire legal system works, period. He who owns the equity controls, period. You have final say in any, anything. So if you were the shareholder, sole shareholder in a legal person because you're the one to put all the equity in, who would you want to appoint as director? Yourself. Probably yourself. I mean, uh, my grandfather always told me when I was growing up, if you want something done right, do it yourself. And in trust law, the grantor and executor can be the same individual. But we're going to find out actually any of these roles can be filled by anybody. It actually really doesn't matter. I think they're talking when they say that in the same capacity, you can be the same individual. But you can be any one of these if you're serving in different capacities. 
And that's when we get into the whole capacity argument that we'll probably hope to cover today. So Dean had a shareholder meeting. He's decided he's about the only competent individual on the planet that can handle his affairs and his investments. So he appoints Dean C. Clifford as the director. Chairman of the board, president, CEO, um, I don't care what you want to call it. I'm the one who gives direction to the corporation, a legal person. So we're just going to put this back to legal person so that everybody doesn't get confused by that. Legal person. And we all know who the employees are. If this is a basically, for lack of a better word, if this is now a public corporation and you and the government came together to form this, there's only one role left, and that's the government. And that's why they're public trustees or public employees. They're public servants. So what this means is, well, let's just stick with this for now. So we got government. <coughs> and government, well, employees. And that's exactly what they are. So that's the business relationship going on. Um, problem is, when they call this name, they know we don't know who we are in this equation. And because of that, that's how they screw us over and they get us into the role of the surety for the legal person or the person who's compelled to perform for the legal person. And really, there's only one role in this entire equation that's forced to, be, forced to perform for a legal person, and that is the trustees. They're the ones liable. They're the ones that are supposed to perform for this legal person. So what happens when we walk into court? So I don't think anybody's got any questions regarding that. It's all pretty simple, right? Pretty basic. No, it's not basic, but everyone remembers that from last week. All right. Okay. So people show up and they go to court when the legal person is called. Court's called. I'll have to rewrite the name, I guess. My Sorry. Remember that for next time. So, court's been called. People show up for court, and they walk up, and, you know, uh, I've heard the arguments, I'm not that person, or I'm not a corporation, I'm a man, and I have human rights, and every other argument the planet's made, and I've made them. You know, four or five years ago, it was the same argument I made. I walked in there, I'm not a corporation, I'm a man. You know, you can't, you can't charge me with that because I have rights, and that violates my rights, and blah, 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 and everything else. Well, that's not at all what's going on in the, in the courtroom. I've had, even recently, people that should know better have walked in and said, yeah, I'm here for that matter, which is a good way to approach that. And then they go on to say, I'm an agent for that person. Of course you're an agent for that person. Everybody in the courtroom there today, once that name is called, is an agent for that person. Otherwise, you wouldn't be there. You'd have no standing at all because the courtroom is nothing more than a hearing, a formal hearing where records are kept regarding this, this, this person right here, like the black book for a corporation, the minutes of, of a meeting. I don't even like to call it a boardroom meeting because if you were having a boardroom meeting, none of them would be there because that's only for directors. So a boardroom meeting would only have one person at it. I can have that wherever I am. I can have one right now in my head. I just did. I changed a couple of policies around for my legal person. It was pretty interesting. So, court's called. You go in there, everybody that is there is an agent for the legal person. As soon as court is, as soon as they, 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 they call the name, now that boardroom, if you want to call it that, or the hearing room, is being used to hear matters for Dean Clifford. If you're not an agent of Dean Clifford, then you're not there. You have no standing. Get out of there. They all do. And why do they all have standing for this person? And who's the government? The people. They're the employees. They're the public employees, right? They're the, uh, I like to call them trustees. I still like to call them public servants or trustees. So the hearing's been called. Um, actually, I don't even need to draw that part. Because what people have to, there's no point in even getting into the chart again. Uh, everything that people have to understand is and you can, if you read sections 32 and 52 of the uh, Charter and Rights and Freedoms, it'll tell you right in there um, that, number one, 
Charter Rights and Freedoms is the supreme law of the Corporation of Canada. It's the supreme law. There's no law higher. It's it. It's the top dog. And then it goes on to say that it only applies to the government. So if the Charter and Rights and Freedoms only applies to government and it's their supreme law, how on earth could any subordinate act ever apply to anything other than the government as well? It can't. It's superseded by the Charter and Rights and Freedoms. And we know damn well, we've been saying for years, we know the statutes only apply to the government. And people try to make faulty arguments in court that uh, don't really prove anything and then, you know, they wind up in jail or get in charge the whole nine yards. So... Uh, I'm not bother, going to bother with any proofs because we already know most of this stuff. Uh, and that is that when you walk into court and they're having a hearing for the person, what they're doing is they're usually charging somebody under the Highway Traffic Act or they're charging somebody with income tax evasion or not filing taxes. Those are the two biggies, I think, with free men, so we should probably stick with those. Now, you probably notice, and again, here's another proof, uh, is that the birth certificate, which is your receipt, is the only document that you have that has the government's signature on it. They sign it and it's sent to you. Everything else has your signature on it. And what that means is the birth certificate proves that the government owes a debt to you and, or an obligation to you in some way. Every other piece of ID where your signature is on there proves that you owe an obligation to the government of some kind. So what they're doing uh, is when they're getting you to or convincing you you need a driver's license to go out and drive. You know, come down and fill out an application and go for a road test. And if you're competent and therefore probably bondable, we'll, we, we can, we'll, we'll underwrite for you. And uh, we'll, we'll give you this nice little license right here that for, uh, for, for no other <coughs> explanation necessary. It actually creates a public servant title for you. So now that you're a public servant, when you're getting pulled over on the highway, license and registration, you know, you know oh, okay, well, here's my driver's license. Well, what you gave him is proof that you were just basically acting as a public servant. Statutes apply to public servants, period. Okay? So you can get out of the, the I'm not engaged in commerce argument. You can get out of all those kind of arguments. Because all they're claiming is that you were performing some function of government when they pulled you over because you gave them a license that identified you as an agent of the government. He's a superior officer. That's why when they say, you, you ha you're required to obey me, well, they're right. Absolutely they're right. They're a superior officer, all the way up to the courts, period. All they have to do is get you to admit that you're performing a function of government, which government issue ID proves. It doesn't but that's the presumption that it creates. And I've talked about how presumptions rule in court because we don't rebut the presumptions properly, right? And then when you go into the court file after three years of fighting the government and filing all sorts of nonsense and crap and gibberish, and you actually look in the judge's file, there's one thing in there, and that's the complaint made against a public servant. That's it. That's the only thing the judge actually sees. And we're going to get into that with some of the court stuff later on after this is all, after everyone gets their, their head wrapped around the whole concept of that. So the same, okay, uh, Taxes. Who owes taxes? Right? Public servants. Public servants. And what created the, uh, the taxpayer? Your application for a social insurance number. So anytime you use that social insurance number to sign up for a job, a bank account, or use that number anywhere else, it identifies you as an agent of the government. And government can tax their own employees and no one else. Why do you think social insurance numbers are optional on bank accounts? And yes, you better believe they are. It even says optional right beside it. They don't force you to do it. The benefit of having a social insurance number is interest on your bank account. What is it, 0.00002% right now, I think, right? Okay, it's nothing. But everybody hears that word, oh, interest. Oh, I don't want to lose out on a little bit of interest I could be getting, right? And that's why we've known for years that if you don't want a social insurance number on your account, you just tell them you want a non-interest bearing account, period. I've asked them that and they said no. Well, yeah, tell them put it in writing. Yeah, they say all sorts, yeah, they all, they say all sorts of nonsense, so. Yeah, a lot of bank policy runs contrary to the Bank Act. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and it's not even their policy. Um, I, I have yet to see an application where it doesn't say optional right on the sheet, so. 
um, or go to a different bank. I had no problems with Steinbeck Credit Union. I've never had a problem at Royal Bank of Canada, uh, TD. I mean, I've taken my social insurance number off my bank accounts. I think 12 years ago was when I first did that because that was my first suspicion back then that something was wrong with the whole thing. So that's very simple. So either way, anything that they're trying to charge you with, uh, doesn't matter what it is, they've gotten you to produce some type of ID that identifies you as a public servant, period. And public servants have to obey their rules and regulations because the government underwrites the damages that public servants cause if they do cause any damage. And so we kind of touched on, touched on liability and uh, uh, assuming full liability and liability issues on one of the previous well, I think at the end of the last class or something like that, where basically if, someone, if, if I'm assuming liability for somebody else's actions, I'm going to want to control what they do to limit the liability. And that's where limited liability comes from. So we should never be afraid of, of, of assuming full liability for our own actions, right? Because then you can get into the whole excuse, well, if I'm assuming full liability for my actions and I never intentionally cause harm, I really can't ever be held accountable for anything, right? Because even unintentionally causing harm is not causing harm. You didn't intend to do that. It just kind of happened, you know. I walked by and I accidentally bumped something, then a ladder fell down and something else happened and someone across the street got hit with a paint can. Well, I didn't actually intend to do that. So you're not really liable. So liability issues. So the government, because they offer limited liability to all their public servants, they want you to, and also they want to be able to charge us with all these infractions and <coughs> charge the, uh, the person here and run up a, a nice big uh, debt that's, uh, that's good for them. So they want us all to be public servants, and that's exactly what they've done. So when you walk into, uh, into summary convictions court, it's, it's not real court. It's actually like an internal tribunal for the Canadian government. We know that. People have been talking about it for years, but we really couldn't prove it, right? And I never used to like to make statements that I had to prove, but I'm kind of finding now that presumptions actually do work really well because that's all they do in their world. And my presumption stands unless they rebut it. Are they ever going to try to rebut any of this stuff? No, they always are completely silent. In fact, in five years, I've never had one reply to any affidavit I've ever sent to the government. None. Believe me, you're going to be pretty safe. They never reply to affidavits. Because any counter affidavit, if you took it into a court of record, would be perjury on their part. And they can't prove shit. They can't prove a thing. So, and they don't ever try to prove a thing. That's why you go to summary convictions. Where, let's compare the differences between Queen's Bench and summary convictions. Queen's Bench, you've got an injured party who makes a filing to the court to bring another party in that owes them something. Right? Summary convictions, what do we got? Presumed jurisdiction where you have to enter a plea. Those two courts don't sound at all the same. So obviously there's got to be some big differences in what's going on. That's why they need to drag you in there, literally. Usually handcuffed. Usually have to have been beaten pretty severely the whole nine yards. Uh, but I will tell you, the only time I actually was not beaten when I was dragged out of my car was when I refused to give a name or a driver's license. That was the only time they were ever really nice to me. You know, sir, are you going to get out of your car now? I said, well, I guess so. I said, you just smashed my window out. I said, you're probably just going to drag me out next physically, aren't you? Yeah, you better believe it. It's like, all right, right, I don't think you will, but whatever. I just got out. And they're like, okay, hands behind the back. And I just said, no. I said, you can handcuff my hands in front of me. Okay, okay, yeah, that's not a problem. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they've never done that to me before. Usually I'm screaming with three of them on top of me as they're trying to break my arm, right? And I will, like, I'd like to add that I've never actually done anything <laughs> wrong. So that just has a bad habit of happening to me. Um, so, yeah, I, didn't, I refused to produce a name. I, did, I refused to give them any ID. And I actually did have a, pri a provincial plate on my truck at, at the time, which doesn't mean anything, right, at all. And we can get into that kind of stuff later on as well. But uh, that was the time where, you know, they handcuffed me. And I said, oh, I said, hang on, this is my concrete finishing hand. I said, you got that on there a little tight. Loosen it up a bit. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. No, you know, they loosen it up, and they're all nice. And then they asked me, you know, they still threw me in jail for four days, but they sure as hell didn't beat me. And they usually love to do the old, you know, quit resisting as they're trying to get you to use your own hand to touch the back of your head. They love that one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So that, that was one thing I did notice, and again, uh, the other incidents we, incident we had recently where uh, one of our friends was pulled over and detained uh, by police for two hours for having no license plate at all, just his private plate, would refuse to produce any kind of a driver's license or any idea of any kind that would identify him as something they have jurisdiction over. They wouldn't dare touch him at all, period. 
And this is the guy that had like uh, had had a, his shotgun with him and his rifle. He was going to go outside the city uh, hunting and uh, a knife on his belt, you know, the camo, the whole nine yards, and they they wouldn't touch this guy. They ended up towing his truck home, but then we sued them, and they've never done that since. So, um, if they had the jurisdiction to beat you without producing any ID of any kind, they would have done it on both those occasions because they really like doing that. So we know that any form of ID that you get from the government that has your signature on it is bad. You do not want that because it identifies you as somebody who's applied for a benefit from the government, which is to become a public servant where the government assumes all liability for your actions. And that forces you to have to obey statutory codes because if the government's assuming liability for your actions, they want to make sure you're not doing anything really stupid. And if you do, they'll drag you into their tribunal and they will correct you. They'll correct your actions. And then off the corrections you go. Right? It's pretty, it's pretty simple, really, when you boil it right down. Um, so where are we going to go with this? I can't remember today. Uh, okay. We could probably even address this question now. So if you're dragged into summary convictions, actually, uh, you know what? I like to uh, talk about the courts as well, too. Uh, a lot of times people are talking about court, you know, provincial court this, provincial court that, the whole nine yards. And uh, people don't realize that there's vast differences between the types of court they hold at the provincial courthouse, right? And the best way to explain it is the same way you visit a food court at the mall. You walk into the mall, there's a food court, right? And they have five or six different restaurants all in a row. Subway, you know, uh, one of those really disgusting Chinese ones where they never wash all the, you know, the equipment. Uh, you know, A and W or whatever they have there, right? It's a food court, so they got six or seven different restaurants there that are have nothing to do with one another. They don't trade food in the kitchen. They don't swap customer information. They're just independent and strictly their own jurisdiction. That's what's going on at the courthouse. How many of you been down to the provincial courthouse? You walk in. And they got, you know, uh, wicket window 100A, 100B, 100C, 100D, 100E, 100F, right? And they've got these different windows where you walk up and you basically place your order, which is filing a lawsuit or responding to charges or doing whatever you're there to do. So they've obviously all these different, otherwise they just have one window. You know, your blanket jurisdiction, we just handle everything right here. Well, they don't. There's different jurisdictions for everything. 100D is summary convictions down at the provincial court. So you're going down to the provincial court to then go to the summary convictions window. And that's where all the problems start to come from. Um, and then we're going to also get into why you should just never go to the courtroom at all, because really a courtroom is for nothing but public servants. The fact that you're there is enough to go on, that you're a public servant, otherwise you wouldn't be there, because it's not their responsibility to teach you who you are. So if you're too dumb to know or you haven't figured it out, I shouldn't say the word dumb because we were never taught this. You know, these people just think they're brilliant because, oh, look how stupid these guys are. They come in here and they have no idea what's going on. It's like, well, yeah, that, that's kind of the whole point of your 12 years of education. You made sure that we're so stupid and incompetent that when we come in here, we can't speak your language at all. And that's what it is. It's just ignorance. It's just, it's ignorance. And it's not even really our faults. It is, but again, it's not. Um, so that's why, again, that's why we're all here, trying to educate ourselves. So now we know what the courtroom is. Um, and why we usually get some of the responses we get when we go up into summary convictions and try to say, well, yeah, I'm here as the administrator of that legal person. And, ah! You know, they freak out because that's not where you're supposed to be. That's not a forum for administrators or shareholders or directors or anything. That's for public servants only. It's an internal tribunal. So we've basically are along the lines of now that we should be shutting that down shortly after receiving the ticket or the charge or whatever else we're doing. In fact, we're even given, we're given time. You got three weeks before you got to show up and do anything with this. No, I want to deal with it right now. No, 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 you got three weeks. No, I'm going down to the courthouse right now. I mean, I've done that. Uh, no, I'm, no, I'm going down there right now. I said, no, you, you, like, you got three weeks. Just wait three weeks. You can't even go down there and deal with it right yet kind of thing, right? Well, they're giving us time to actually uh, to, to remedy the situation long before it actually has to go to a hearing or court or a plea or anything else, any other kind of nonsense. So that's what's going on in summary convictions court, and that's the problem everybody's having, obviously, because every time you're charged with anything, it's in summary convictions court. They obviously have no claim withstanding in fact against you, or you'd be in Queen's Bench, where they actually hear matters that have an actual claim, right? 
And in, if it's an internal tribunal for public servants, that's no different than serving in the military. They don't, they don't even have to have anything against you. They can just punish you. They do that. Insubordination. You looked at an officer the wrong way. We're going to punish you. We're going to charge you with obstructing a peace officer just because you looked. I didn't like the way you looked at me. Well, that's how it works in that world. And that's one of the best reasons to never be a public servant. Right? So um, that's summary convictions. We just kind of went over what that all is. Anybody have any questions, anything else about that? No, uh, I was thinking, well, of course, it may apply more to Queen's Bench. I'm not sure. But, you know, you're, you're often arrested. You give it a promise to appear. You sign yep. it under duress. Yep. Marking it as under duress or whatever. So you've usually got three weeks to a month before you're supposedly. There are sometimes you're dragged in right away. Yeah. Right. And the problem is we're not, telling, we're not letting these people know who we are when we're getting pulled over. So if you want to start dealing with things at the side of the road, um, the minute you get pulled over and detained, yeah, especially if you, uh, if you don't want to produce a driver's license, um, destroying presumptions, removing presumptions of any kind. We spoke about that last class, and that's the whole idea that when you, when you walk up, you know, uh, you guys all invited me out for dinner. I went to a big restaurant. There's 10 of us sitting down at a table, and every single one of us sitting there eating wondering, Who's paying for this? And no one talks about it. Everybody just eats. And then people start getting up and leaving, and you end up being the last guy at the table going, oh, shit, I guess it was me. Right? It probably would have been a good idea to address that when you first got there, or when they even called you to go over for dinner that night. <laughs> hey, Dean, you want to come over for dinner? Yeah, you know what? That's a great idea. Um, who's paying? Well, I thought we'd all pay for our own meals. Okay, great. Yeah, I'll see you guys down there. Right? I like those terms. That sounds pretty good. So get the terms out there right at the outset, right from the first contact. Right? Remove presumptions. You show up for dinner, you're sitting down, you order your meal, you're having a beer. Hey, so what are we all doing? Are we gonna are we gonna all pay for our own meals? Is uh, one guy gonna pay? How you know, you know, get it out there before it comes down to the bill time. And everyone's well, I thought he was gonna pay. Well, I thought you were gonna pay for mine. You know, well you invited me, you should be paying. You know, none of that kind of nonsense. And that's how you should be dealing. Yes. Well, without getting into immediate commentary. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was going to bring beer. Um, nice. Uh, summary conviction court. Um, unless you've done something criminal wrong, uh, there's no reason to plea. You never have to plea, ever. And that is, uh, what is that, 706.2 of the Criminal Code of Canada under summary convictions? I think if uh, my book's around here, hang on, I'll look it up right now and I'll read it to you. Uh, let me see if I've got it. Right there. Oops, sorry. There's two real gems in here that I'm going to teach people that if you just were to bring up these two in court, if you wanted to go, there's no reason to go to court. Send it into the courthouse in writing with a motion before the court. Long before you have to, you have to show up there, it won't be there anymore. And just let them know you're not going to be coming. And if you want, you can remove the presumption right at the outset and say, I think the summary convictions is for public servants. And I've never seen any evidence that, that, or claims that I am a public servant. So I don't think I'll be showing up at your, at your internal tribunal. I mean, just write it out. Send it in. Well, what's that going to harm you? There's no worse than any of the other arguments I've heard people make when they go to court. Yeah, I've, well, uh, negative averments are always nice too, right? I have not seen any facts or been provided with any evidence that I am a public servant and I believe no such evidence exists. Write that down. Yeah. Send it in with a motion to dismiss. What are they going to do? Yeah. You submit that by mail or you do Absolutely. I don't even go down there. I mail it into them. So, because we all know what kind of attention we get when we go down to those wickets at 100 D or uh, you know the, the the Broadway one there too, and uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, geez, no, you know what? It's a different. Ah, oh, geez, I'm gonna have to look it up afterwards, anyways. But it has to do with uh, pleas, and you'll notice again in the criminal code, there's nothing in here about Queen's Bench. Nothing. It's all summary conviction and trials. Nothing. Summary conviction only. Well, if this was a criminal code to do with Canada in general, wouldn't this have Queen's Bench or anything else in it? It doesn't. It's only got penalties, which take up, I might add, about three quarters of the book. Penalties for failure to obey these codes when you're a public servant. That's more so what it is. Okay. And then uh, what is it? What is the most? There's a couple in here. I'm gonna. I'll, well, I'll have a break later, and I'll, I'll think. I'll look up the names of the two codes that I'm thinking of right now. And the other one is basically. You are not compelled to enter a plea at all. A trial cannot commence until the plea has been made. Period. No plea, no trial, which is where the court tries to open to enter one for you. Right? And all you have to do is say, I, I don't allow you to enter a plea for me. Period. 
There's not going to be any plea. I haven't seen a claim made against me yet. I will not enter a plea until I see a claim made against me. And they're all, they're all the bluster and the nonsense and everything else, it's all irrelevant. Because everything we talked about last time is another thing people don't understand or realize is that with all the nonsense that's going on in the court and everybody thinks that every time they get up and they're saying, you know, this, that, the whole nine yards and, uh, you know, my transcripts from last time say this and uh, you take the stand and you, you testify on the stand, uh, you, you give stuff to the, the, to the Crown and you send stuff in and everything, evidence and all your, your nonsense, you and the Crown trade back and forth, none of that actually happened. None of it. There's nothing on the court record. Summary convictions is not a court of record at all. Why do you think they call it summary convictions? Okay, There is a way to get things on the, on the record, but for the most part, how many people have gotten a transcript of one of their trials? Okay, Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, other than the fact that half of the stuff has been deleted, what's the, what's the more important part? The things that are changed. Not the things that are changed even. It even gets more like, sinister than this. Like the, who they title, who what? Not even that. No? Who says it's on the record? It says this is a transcript of a record. Does it say court record? No. no. Did the transcript come from the court? No. When you go and you order that transcript to their little window, it comes from a private transcript company. It's not a matter of public record. It's a record. Well, big deal. I keep a record in one of my books over there of everything I do during the day when I go to the job site. What the hell does that prove? Nothing. One of the, one of the biggest things that, you know, you got to remember, everything's all about concealing and, and lying to you and making sure the truth has been concealed as much as possible or you're just confused, like you actually believe that this transcript you got is a, is a court record because you went and you ordered it from the, from the window. Yeah, it got a little dark in here. <laughs> so that's one big problem also because number one, people don't know how to, how to get their paperwork, their affidavits into the court file, the public court file, and then just because they went and got a copy of the transcripts, see it's right on the transcripts! Look at, look at that! And they just went ahead and ruled against me anyways, right? The judge doesn't have a copy of that transcript, never happened. Came from a private company, it's a service that's provided so that you and the Crown have access to what happened, which keeps it private between the parties. Everything that court is doing, they're trying to keep it private between the parties. They don't want the judge to see any evidence except the original complaint. And that's why they have a 97% conviction rate. Because the only thing in that court file by the end, if you have a lawyer that just worked for you for three years, number one, your lawyer didn't file one motion in the court, not one. I've seen it. Not only that, the transcripts aren't a matter of public record. The whole thing never happened. On the books, the only thing that happened was there was a complaint and a conviction. That's it. That's the sad reality of it. So all the arguments you're, arguments you're making in court are almost irrelevant as well until you actually are able to make it a court of record, which it's not. They don't even pretend it is, and that's why your transcripts even say this is a transcript of a record, of a record. Well, again, you see it's, it's, it's all about deceiving you. That's pretty sad when you think that you've got this transcript that you order from a court window at a courthouse. When you finally get it, it turns out the tape was sent to a private company who made the transcripts and then made it available to you and the Crown but it's not actually a matter of the court record. And that's why the first uh, transcripts to a court record or whatever are so much, whereas if you order it after somebody else orders it... They're free. So yeah, because they've already been done. And that tells me that the transcripts were never made until you ordered them. So if they're never even made until you order them, how could they possibly be on the record? Right? And even once you do order them, they're still not on the record, even though it's a verified copy from a, from a licensed uh, transcriber. So it's not that. we just realized this the other week. We got thinking about it, and they're like, man, we're like, look at these trans, look at the stuff going on here. How could, how could they get away with this? And we're doing the same frustrated thing everybody else is doing. And I just sat there and went, well, wait a minute. How, how do we even know if this is even on the record? I mean, yeah, sure, they gave us a, a, a printout, a, a typing up of all the, everything that happened in the court, but... It looks like everything that they're doing is trying to, is the judge sits up there for three days and just kind of looks at you and just and laughs and watches the bantering going back and forth between you and the crown. And it's all irrelevant because it's all kept in the private. Not anything is on the record. 
which means the entire the argument is held completely private until the time where the judge says, oh, well, I'm going to have to convict you on the facts because, you know what, uh, the only thing in my court file is the, uh, is the complaint. On the record, you haven't offered up one rebuttal to anything that went on, period. Especially if you hire a lawyer. That's the sad part. Is this a big distinction between pleading guilty to the charges and guilty for guilty to the facts? Yeah, like I said, I tried pleading guilty to the facts one time for, for three days in a row. I tried pleading guilty to the facts. And every time it was, Mr. Clifford, if you're going to plead guilty, it's with the understanding you've done something wrong. And I got up and I said, well, I've done nothing wrong, so I guess I'm just going to go sit down again. The end of the three days, well, I'm going to have to uh, find you guilty uh, to the facts. He's like, well, thank you. I've, I've been trying to plead that for three days now. Right? It doesn't prove guilt. In fact, even the word guilt, uh, guilty or not guilty, was that even, uh, is that, does that mean you think you didn't do what they're claiming you didn't do? Or does that mean you actually feel guilty about it or not? Right? I mean, there's that argument alone. I wouldn't even get into that one. That's more of a philosophical debate than anything, right? Yeah, that's it. I mean, yeah, okay, well, you know, I, well, I don't think I did what this guy says I did. But, but even if I did, I, I probably wouldn't feel guilty about it because I really don't think there was anything wrong with what I did. Yeah, exactly. So lots of fun stuff you can do with summary convictions. So what we're finding now is it's a lot more fun when you start filing motions into summary convictions and affidavits. And we started doing that back in the fall anyways, and uh, that's, that's when the fun things started happening in summary convictions because when you send it down there now with instructions to make sure that it gets into the court file, and if I mail it in, do whatever you want with instructions that it gets into the court file. Um, send instructions to also get a certified copy back out. Because if they don't give you a certified copy back out, you're going to find that it probably disappears from the court file as well. There's nothing honorable about anything they do in summary convictions. It's not a court of record. You have to make them accountable, and that's proof. So if you go down to that window 100D, and they're refusing, refusing, to file an affidavit into your into your uh, into the court file 100D, which they do. We actually had that happen what three three four weeks ago. The guy working the counter said, "Nope." He goes, "Nope. We don't know. That's that's not a court document. We're not going to take that." It's summary convictions. There is no no forms. It's not Queen's Bench. They don't accept forms. And if an affidavit doesn't go in a court file, what the hell does go in a court file? Now that we know the transcripts aren't there, your affidavit's not there. Technically, you didn't even say anything on the record at all in your defense. The only thing left in there is a, is a, is a complaint against you from someone that's not even certified. It's just a complaint. It's not, it's not an affidavit. Nothing. So that's the problem we're having in summary conviction. It's just uh, lifting, lifting the fog of everything they're doing there and keeping everything private. It's kept very, very private to the point, like I say, where the only thing left in the judge's file probably would be whatever arrest warrant they have for you, maybe the original complaint, and then definitely your conviction. Um, no, it's, it's not, it doesn't have the effect of an affidavit. Number one, you've probably noticed as well, even though we haven't actually found a lot of the references for this in the law, um, the cop's signature is boxed off the document. And then the information he writes is boxed off the document, and all the other information is boxed off. And there's certain parts that are open to the rest of the document and everything else. So we already know that, number one, uh, there, I would expect that to be a flimsy excuse from them if you ever then took them to Queen's Bench and sued them for damages. They'd be like, oh, well, what are you talking about? I don't see his signature on this document. You know, it's, uh, it's boxed out of there. But do you think that's an honest... Uh, Absolutely not. Like, boxed off? Like, uh, this, just uh, the perception of the document. If something's boxed off, it doesn't really exist for another legal... If it's, if it's boxed off, it has nothing to do with the body of the document. Okay. Right? Yeah, it's basically like its own page within a page. So what does it mean? The document is kind of meaningless, but I'm sure they'll take it on face value in their own court and right. probably choose to ignore it in other places well, wherever it suits them, right? This is something that we can include, and I know that you don't endorse this. I don't endorse it. This is something that we can include in our claim of right for a notice of understanding this. Here's what I think. Yep. Can you prove me wrong? I think another thing, too, is uh, one of the other points I want to go over with people is uh, the method in dealing with this stuff, because everybody's going in there and they're getting mad at the judges, you know, and they're getting mad at the court. They're challenging the, the, the court's jurisdiction. Yeah, so you walk in there and you, you challenge the court's jurisdiction. Okay, well, number one, the court can't hear a jurisdictional challenge at all. That's why you're ignored altogether. And why can't the court hear a jurisdictional challenge? They can only do it within their own jurisdiction. 
no man can rule in his own cause. How could they make a ruling on jurisdiction for their own court? It's impossible. So a jurisdictional challenge is just out of the, the realm of what they're even willing to hear, right? Any, any wrongdoing by the court, they can't hear that as well, right? You'd have to take that up with a different court's jurisdiction using your transcripts that you get, right? Oh, what would be a great way to get the, to, what would be a good thing to do with those transcripts if you get them next time? No? I'd like to, yeah, believe me. But if you decide you're going to go to trial or you really want to fight this thing, you really want to go to public servant arena court and have it out with them and you've got your transcripts from the last time, what would be the best thing to do with those? File them into the court record. Now, they are a matter of record, and they're certified. They come with a certification stamp right on them. So, just quickly before we go to break, do you think that it helps any to say on the record or for the record? Yes, but a little bit different. A little bit different. you uh, got to remember, even the, the, the Court Act, the uh, Manitoba Court Act, or whatever the hell it is, that, uh, that created the provincial courts, um, Just the, the entire thing is just replete with common law references right through the whole thing, right? So even though summary convictions is, is kept off private for that whole reason, to keep things off the record, because anything of record is in common law jurisdiction. That's why they keep it private. Off the record, transcripts aren't nothing, nothing really happened, right? And that's a lesson I learned once. I think I told you guys that, where the sheriffs came in, the judge just looked at the sheriffs. They walked over, they grabbed me. I didn't say anything. They took me downstairs for an hour, brought me back up. And the next time I went to court, I was like, oh, yeah, like the last time when you guys had the sheriffs grab me and, and throw me downstairs, they're like, oh, I don't see any record of that. I was like, oh, you bastards. And they're right. There was no record of it. So I made sure there was a record of it. Next time I came back to court, I had an affidavit sworn out of what happened. And I filed that into the court record. And, yes, now there was a record of it. So they started to get kind of nervous at the end of three days. So I did that myself. Uh, I, I, and I figured that out last year somehow. I didn't even know what was going on. But I was able to make it a court of record by swearing out an affidavit of everything that happened last time and filing that into the, into the, uh, the, 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 the summary convictions desk so that an affidavit was now on the record. And it's up to the Crown to rebut that. And the Crown gets a copy of everything you file into the record. You don't even need to produce one for them. That's what I was getting at. I was going to get onto a different tangent here about dealing with these matters before it goes to court. And that is a simple matter that we all get mad at the court. You know, we want to start yelling at the judge and telling the judge things. And this is what's going to work around here in the whole nine yards. And I'm a sovereign and you bow down to me kind of stuff. Why, why are we even talking to the judge about these matters? Who brought the claim to the court? Crown. Why is our problem the judge? The judge is only going off the information he was given by the Crown. The Crown said we were a public servant and we were disobeying orders. So who's our problem with? Crown. So we want to address that guy first. And we want to do it before court. And we can rip his case apart, destroy it before even the first hearing. Period. And that's by contacting this guy and requesting particulars that he's not going to be giving us in full disclosure. For instance, One of the things I'd want to want to get some, some clarification of before I ever go to court is I'd want something from the Crown proving that I was even performing a function of government, acting as an agent of the government at the time the complaint was made. It's all capacity, right? Um, so you just turn that around. I mean, instead of trying to prove the negative, which the onus on you... you get them to them prove. And there's a couple of very easy ways to do that I've come up with that I haven't even... I, I don't think I'm ever going to have to try to use them in court. I don't think there's going to be a much of a problem with that anymore. Um... But the other thing that I was just going to say, and I kind of forgot. Um, <clears throat> oh, yeah. When you, yes, yeah, let me know how much time we have left. Uh, well, a minute or two. minute or two? We'll okay. Yeah. Everybody has to understand also that just because you produced a driver's license at the side of the road does not mean you were acting in that capacity at the time. You may have produced a driver's license. Big deal. A cop can show you his badge when he's at home having dinner with his family. Does that mean he's on duty? No. Aren't badges recycled? I have no idea. Absolutely no clue. That's another thing I covered last time, too, by the way. People are always asking me questions about this and that and everything else, and I like to tell people right off the hop, say, look, I, I've come to the conclusion that I'm not making presumptions anymore about what the government's doing because it's impossible to prove. I don't know what you're thinking right now, 
I don't know what anybody in this room is thinking. But what I can do is I can make a statement of what I'm thinking and what I'm doing. And I shield myself with that. Right? Then I don't give a shit what anybody else is doing. Because I know what's going on in my own little bubble over here. This I can prove. I can't prove anything else. And the same thing with them. They can only prove things on their side. They can't really prove your intent or anything that you've done, period. So now, the, once the burden of proof gets onto them, they're pretty much sunk. And there's easy ways to get them, basically, to prove your case for you. And these, they're all pretty simple as well. So, And we can touch on a couple of the things that uh, I think the, the, the one guy that went into court, uh, whose story was that about uh, basically telling the, telling the judge they were a terrorist? Yeah, that was, that was, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was, I mean, that was good. It was funny. I didn't think he was actually going to do that when I told him to do that that one time. So, okay, we'll break, though. Then we'll, yeah, we'll cut out. Yeah, and then we'll come back. Okay, I can't remember what we were going to speak about in the second half here now. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. Here's the other thing, too, a lot of people don't understand. They think that when they go down to the, uh, they go down to the police and they make a statement, you know, like... Uh, uh, you know, so-and-so with the RCMP phones you up and, oh, we've got a complaint against you or somebody says you've assaulted somebody else and we need you to come down to the station and make a statement, right? And you're like, and what, what happens if you just say, ah, you know what, I, I don't really think I, I, I should come down and make a statement. I just don't want to. And they try to force you to come down and make a statement. And, well, we'll come arrest you or we'll do this or the whole nine yards and you better come and do it peacefully while you still have the chance the whole nine yards, okay? Number one, you have every right in the world to never testify against yourself, until you've actually been charged. Because all you're going to do by going down and talking to them in advance is give them more information to use to charge you. Once they've made the charge, they cannot add information to it. It's done. Period. So why would you ever go speak to these people before you've been charged, number one? Number two, everybody thinks that everything they talk about with the RCMP is a matter of, a matter of public record. That's the same misunderstanding people have with summary convictions court. What on earth would make people think that anything they talk about with the RCMP is a matter of public, public record? They're a private corporation. They're a private service. They're private entirely. Anything that you tell them is going to be held internally. It's going to be private information. And they will choose what they're going to use and what they're not going to use. Do you think they're ever going to use anything to help you? <laughs> Absolutely not. Not even not likely. No, never. They never would do it, period. So it's actually completely against, against you to go say anything to these people ever. In fact, you should never have to speak with them. Yeah. After you've been charged, well, you've got every right in the world to then go in to fight that charge and summary conviction, right? Or wherever they decide to take you. So no, they are, so that it kind of comes down to, again, the records are being kept. RCMP records are kept by the RCMP. Crown records are kept by the Crown. Okay? That's all private. Nothing exists in the public. So when we, um, I don't know how many times we've gone to court and we've gone in there complaining to the judge, well, you know what, we sent all these documents to the Crown and they haven't replied and this and that, the whole nine yards, the Crown just stands there and goes, I don't know what they're talking about, I never got nothing from them. Now we're standing there with a handful of, of registered mail receipts of stuff we sent to the Crown Prosecution. They deny it right to your face, right in court. Well, number one, they know they don't have to worry about it because you're unaware of the fact that transcripts aren't on the record anyways. But number two, they don't have to worry because they already know the court's not going to let you file any stuff in the court record. So he's pretty much going to get away scot-free with completely lying in the courtroom. Just outright, outright blatant fraud. So that's one of the things we want to address with people is number one, is how to start getting the stuff into the court record. And then number two, making sure that the transcripts are available. Um, you know what? Even if the transcripts aren't going to help you in summary conviction, those transcripts are going to help you when you take them to task to answer for their crimes in your arena. And that's the common law arena. And what is common law at the courts? Queen's bench. Why aren't people taking Crown attorneys and, and, uh, and government officials and even, even summary convictions itself, which is a, a private corporation? Why aren't people taking them to Queen's Bench? File your own lawsuit against them in Queen's Bench. Right? Just read through the Crown's Liability Act. It's all there. They're liable, but no one ever does that. Period. I've never even heard of that. I asked around. Everybody I know in Canada has been doing this stuff for a decade. I said, yeah, who's lost better to take somebody to Queen's Bench and lose? They're like... I don't, I don't think we've ever taken anybody into Queen's Bench. 
Well, it's there. It's there for us to use. That's our remedy. It's in Queen's Bench. Why the hell has nobody done this yet? In fact, it blew my mind. I can't believe it. We've been fighting people. We've been on the defensive for, for 15 years in summary convictions. And nobody has once yet taken everything that happened in summary convictions and gone to Queen's Bench with it and filed a claim against them, the government. Which you can. You better believe they're going to have to hear that because otherwise there's no such thing as courts for us. So Queen's Bench has to hear it, even when it's against the province of Manitoba. Period. And that is a court of record. Everything that happens there is a court of record. So that's very important. It's the only court of record that we have access to. What, Queen's, Bench? Queen's Bench. Now, summary convictions, and I know some people are doing this now, summary convictions, um, what a lot of people are doing now, you've got to remember, at any time you can invoke common law. Even, or, uh, even in summary convictions. And that's one of the things you brought up earlier. And that's one of the best ways to do that is not, to, is not saying something on and for the record, right? Because we all know that's just going to go on to the record that we get a transcript of. I mean, I've said that before. I'd like, I'd like to say something for the record. And he's like, Mr. Clifford, everything here is on the record, right? Or everything here is a matter of record or something like that. Whatever the hell they say, it turns out to be just nonsense because, it's, of course, it's in the transcripts but the transcripts aren't part of the public record. That's the difference. You've got to remember that. RCMP keep their own records, right? Crown keeps their own records. If it's not a matter of public record, it never happened. Those are all private institutions. They're not a matter of public record. I was just going to say, um, can you go to the courthouse and order a review record? Order a record for whatever. Yep. Yeah, but they're not, they're not allowing you to put it in the court file anymore. No, what I mean is... Seems really simple. <laughs> yep. Record one, like, if I were to decide to go to court, I'd tell the guy, I want to see uh, Dean Clifford's record. I'd like to order it. Here's my five bucks. Yeah. Like, that's the only way I'd see The transcripts, it. yes. Transcripts, whatever. But, so yeah. It gives me the file, because I've done this lots of times. I've been to so much court. Okay. I'll go stand at the uh, uh, copier there. Yep. Photocopy. But... It occurred to me while I was doing that, if I wanted to admit something, all I got to do is put it in right there. And that's it. Here you go. Okay. Now it's public record. Well, so when people look at this... I'm going to tell you why... Record. Okay, yeah, it's in a public record. Mm -hmm. But is, record is it in the summary convictions file that you're fighting? Queen's Bench. That Queen's Bench and summary convictions have nothing to do with one another. You're at the food court. Okay. And you're trying to take stuff from Taco Bell and put it into A&W's wicket. Okay, you can't do that. They have nothing to do with one another. Okay, and they're not, they're not allowing us access to the summary convictions files. And we don't know what to do about it. We didn't until recently. Like, we've, we've come up with some reasons, we have some stuff we've talked about here before in class that I won't get into right now on camera and stuff like that, but uh, for getting access to the, to the, to the court files. But... Uh, where was I going to that? The public, yeah. So everybody has to understand that this stuff is not making it into the public record. So when you say stuff in court, like, on and for the record, and they're like, of course, everything here is on the record. Well, they're talking about the transcripts. That's all they're talking about. It's not actually getting into the court file that the judge sees. That's the public record, right? So one of the ways you can invoke common law is to walk into the court when they're first starting up the hearing, and they call the name. They say, yeah, you know, blah blah, so and so against, uh, you know, whatever Dean Clifford. And you get up there and you said, yeah, I'm here, I'm here regarding that matter. And then they say name, and you can, I don't care what you say at that point. You can actually say, well, my name, my name is Dean, but I'm not the legal person. I say, and I'm convening a court of record. As soon as you tell them that you're, con you are convening a court of record. Everything that now happens in that courtroom is on the record. Well, it doesn't really matter who you are. If you want to convene a court of record, then you convene it, but nobody ever does. Well, even if you're You can be anybody. As long as, you are in aid, as long as you're there in that courtroom and you have standing, you can convene a court of record. They never do that. The two people I do know that have done that, Judge and the Crowns, both got up and walked out of the room because they didn't want anything that they were going to say or do being on the public record that question. Again, we're getting into the presumption land, right? If we're going out for dinner, I want to know who's paying. Walk in. Excuse me. 
is everything that happens in this courtroom a matter of public record? Not just on the record. Well, well, yeah, sure, it's on the record. Okay, I want to know if it's a matter of public record. Because that's the stuff they can't get out of. Everything else is private up to that point. If it's private, it never happened. Private is, privacy is between the parties. So once the judge walks up, then they'll just, they'll just reconvene another time or they'll do whatever type thing, right? And that's about the time where you want to... Um, that, that's why, I mean, you can do that. But be prepared for the fact they're either going to call sheriffs, they're just going to get up and walk out, uh, something else nasty that I haven't even thought of yet or had happen to me is going to happen. It's just, it's not going to solve anything, right? Especially because they don't like being embarrassed publicly. They, they really don't like that. If you want to deal with it, and, and again, you're now embarrassing the court when the problem is the Crown has brought a claim against you. But wait, wait, wait. This is contempt. Many people are held in contempt of court. Uh, yep. It, it's don't just contempt. Bringing anything into the court records that is against the court itself is considered contempt. No. For some strange reason. No, I wouldn't say that at all. In fact, uh, somebody I know, I just, uh, I, I, I read the affidavit and I should have known better and I read through it and the affidavit that they were filing into uh, summary conviction was, was fine and I didn't realize that the, the person had accused the, uh, the previous judge of uh, contempt of court in the affidavit. I didn't realize it at first. I'm like, well, you, you can't accuse somebody in their own court of committing contempt of court kind of thing, right? It's their own jurisdiction. They can't. So it's another reason you just don't want to get into that stuff there. But, it, but the minute you say, I'm convening a court of public record, and everything is now a matter of public record, and they've been made aware of that, that's the difference, right? If you just go on with what they think is a private hearing, and you come along afterwards and you shove some uh, transcript in there to, to get it all on the, on, the, on the public record, even though they thought they were convening a private hearing, right? That's very bad. I wouldn't do that. I'm sure you could, uh, now there's privacy issues there too, right? So that's why we've got to just keep people basically out of summary convictions altogether. Just don't even go there. Handle administratively before you get there. And that means your problem is now with the Crown. So deal with the Crown before your first hearing. He's the guy dragging you into court. Period. So why aren't we contacting these people in advance and asking questions from them? Everybody goes there and they're like, well, I didn't get full disclosure, right? Well, I gave him full disclosure. Well, yeah, but there's, there's, you know, I don't see, you know, there, there, there's nothing in here that proves that la, 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 and all this kind of nonsense and everything else, right? Uh, disclosure is a bunch of crap we don't care about anyways. And disclosure, nothing from this disclosure except for the original complaint is actually in the judge's file. It's all nonsense. It's all just private discussions back and forth between the two parties, right? So one of the things I would do is uh, when I send a letter to a crown or to, to government of any type, the top of my documents always says this document is a matter of public record. I've shown you on that, on my documents before, everything. So when I contact them, I want them to know I'm not contacting them privately. This is a matter of public record. I'm going to make this a matter of public record. Just be aware of that in my dealings with you. Right? So that's just being honorable. I want them to know I'm not going to get them into a little secret room where I catch them with a bag full of money sliding under the table to me and then go right to the media. But it doesn't matter if it's to the government to anybody else. You've got to say it's an important notice. You've got to take care of it. Ah, an important, you know, I don't give a shit about important notices. If it's not a matter of public record, it's private. Oh. There's only two. There's <laughs> private matters and there's public record matters. End of story. So let them know right at the outset, just so you're aware, you're if, paying for dinner. If it was a private matter, then it would be contact. It is a contract. It's a private contract. Okay? No, don't, yeah. But we'll talk about that another time. It is all private contract, period. Only when you, only when you bring a civil claim against somebody in a, in, a, in a public record arena is everything that's done. You can... Sorry, but there is even greater than just between you and the government. There is you and everybody else. Of course. But that's... Yeah. No, that's all good. Okay, so that deals with that, and I can't remember if I was going to make another point. Okay, so now we want to deal with the Crown before, uh, before criminal charges, or after criminal charges have been laid, we're now in court for five counts of whatever they're claiming nonsense that we, we've been charged with. So, we, again, we want to contact the Crown. We want to ask the Crown some simple questions. Well, if you guys are bringing a claim against me, you know, I want you to prove some certain things. What would be a couple of good things that maybe the Crown should have to prove? Well, or who you 
No, no, because they always find you. They always find you guilty of the facts. Always, right? They just charge me with standing here. Yep, you're standing there. You're right. He's guilty. Okay, how many? How much of a fine is that? Okay, that's what happens in summary conviction. They've got a fine in there for standing the wrong way if you're a public servant. Okay. Well, number one, you should be contacted. Are, are you claiming that I was acting as a public servant at the time the complaint was being made? Do you think they're going to reply to that? No. No. So you may want to send it registered mail, let them know it's a matter of public record. Even just registered mail, just ask them. Not even using that nonsense. The only reason I do that is I'm doing much, much worse stuff to them. So. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a really good question. Or a simple statement. How about an affidavit that you sent to the Crown that they haven't rebutted by the time court comes around? In fact, you can even go to summary conviction and say, actually, I have some affidavits I've sent off to the Crown that they haven't rebutted to you or responded to yet. I'd like another couple of weeks to, to clear that up before I come back here to file it all into the court record. That's a nice way of dealing with things. You don't want to embarrass these people. They get very angry when you do that. That's that whole corned animal kind of thing, right? Okay. If you, want to, if, you, if you want to ask the Crown lots of questions, I think I, uh, I wrote down my answer to, uh, to what I think would be a very, very key part of a Crown's case. If they're claiming that you're a public servant and you're acting, and again, we talked about this when the cameras weren't on, just because you have a driver's license and you produce it when it's asked for, it doesn't mean you are acting in the capacity of a driver or a public servant at the time they ask for the license. It's like a cop showing his badge at a dinner party. Hey guys, look, I'm a cop. Shows his, yeah, look, yeah, look at my badge. Okay, is he on duty? No. He's just getting drunk and showing his ID, right? Not only that, the driver's license is property of the province. So when a public servant demands it from you, you have to give it to them. It's their property, right? Does that prove you're acting as a public servant at that point in time? Yeah, I know. It's irrelevant, though. So, okay, so there you go. So impersonating. So that actually would fit right into this. So what would be the best way to have the Crown prove your case for you? That you could not possibly be performing a function of government at the time you were pulled over? It's a pretty simple one for me. Produce the... Pay roll records. Produce the payroll records. It's a pretty good way of proving I wasn't on the clock as a public servant when you pulled me over. Or that I've ever been acting as a public servant because government has payroll, do they not? Doesn't matter what department you're working for, doesn't matter what service you're providing. There will be a government payroll record of it. It'd be one good way. If they can't produce a payroll record, you're being paid on the government payroll to perform a function of government, then how could you possibly have been acting as a public servant? The government has to produce evidence. They have to produce evidence. Uh, that it has contract with you. Payroll record. <laughs> exactly, yeah. What service were you claiming I was performing? Do you have a record of that? They have records of everything. It's the government. Your, C your CRA file is, is eight miles thick. They've got a record of everything. Hey, what if you're uh, collecting UI? What does that prove? It would be EI. Yeah. It, uh, if anything, it actually proves you're, you're not working. You're on EI. Okay. Yeah. Well, you were working because you were receiving EI. It's like, well, actually, wouldn't that mean that I, I wasn't working? That's the whole reason we collect EI, isn't it? Of course, it could be argued that you're accepting a government benefit. No, nope. you paid into that. That's, a, that's your benefit. That is all that is, is an insurance claim. An insurance claim, an insurance policy, Canada Revenue Agency, that is afforded to all public servants. Nice little insurance policy where you can give them half everything you make your entire life to get nothing back out of it. So for those of us who contracted, let's say, years and years and years ago, under when it was still unemployment insurance, given certain benefits, which were at 
time totally tax deductible, uh, what gave the government the right to change it to the Employment Insurance Act, change the benefits, change the... Who knows? Do I care? Without our assent, without our signature. That's within government. Do I care? No. No, I don't. That's proving... Uh, that's trying to prove a presumption. That's knowing why the government did something. To be honest with you, I don't care why they did something. It's not my business. I don't care. I'm not a public servant. Right? I'm down over here. We can get into that in other days about, about how basically... That's just conditions of receiving that benefit, just to get you off it as quickly as possible. I don't think they could. Telling, telling you you have to find work. So is that an order? It's an agreement. Or we're not going to pay you anything yeah, more. Well, of I course, it's just a term. You were, you were, you were to you paid into it for so many years. That's what I mean. It's actually your money. Yeah. You can't put a condition on giving somebody's money back. So that would be a whole other arena that I, I get into. Yeah. But I haven't filed in 16 years. I don't think I'll be getting EI anytime soon. So I don't care. Right? The only people who care about their EI benefits are employees of the government. And I'm not one. So I don't care. Period. That's that's that I was often thought about when I got that check. I was like, I'm an employee of the government. I used to think that. It's like, they're paying me. It's my turn. I know I can't do it. I'm entitled to this. But yeah. Getting that check.